My name is Preston James. I am the founder and CEO of DevInc. Um, I welcome all of you here today. I'm super excited. I'm, I'm actually giddy uh, today because I've got some old friends that are up here, and uh, you know we get ready to roll into Afrotech. So some of you are here for Afrotech. Some of you are here just for today. But either way, it's all of us together. It's all of us together, coming together, because um, essentially we want to know our way forward. Can I say it again? We want to know our way forward. We want to know our way forward, and we want to talk about it. We want to we want to come together, and let's, let's get real with it. Yeah. Let's get real with it. So, uh, got some friends here that are going to kind of take us and show us the way, the way forward. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just go, go through a few words here, and then we're going to just, just sort of just kind of kick into it. Yeah, let's see here. Nope, this thing is on, on the laser. <laughs> OK, wrong one. All right, so um, just to kick off really quick, I want to I want to thank our partners uh, for supporting us appearing on this event. More friends on here. So, Black Girl Ventures. If you don't know, was founded by Omi Bell, uh, and uh, she, she can't be here with us today. But she and I started together around the same time back in 2016 with the same sort of vision and mission of how do we support entrepreneurs, black entrepreneurs. Black Girl Ventures is specifically focused on women, black women and providing funding for them. So Black Girl Ventures has been around and they've been, we've been partnering up at Afrotech for the last two years and we've done other things together as well. And then also uh, a big thank you to JP Morgan Chase uh, who has been our partner for about seven years supporting Div Inc. Yes. So a big hand for them. Um, and some of you don't know that, you know, I'll, t I'll talk about it a little bit more. The Div Inc. is actually a nonprofit organization, so a lot of our funding does come from corporate partners. And JP Morgan has led the way uh, for all of the funders. They are the number one funder and supporter for, for Divi. So uh, thank you for the JP Morgan team. There are quite a few of them here today. All right, so uh, a little bit about Divi. Uh, essentially, back, you know, I was, at, I was at Dell for some 20 years. I left Dell, got into the startup ecosystem. And long story short, what I saw, I didn't like. <laughs> what I saw was this innovation economy that was sort of booming in Austin, Texas. And my experience had been, I had been traveled the world and saw innovation that was happening in many parts of the world. In Austin, it was a booming city for tech innovation. But the challenge was we weren't being included. Mm -hmm. Black, brown, women were absent mm -hmm. from this journey. That didn't sit well with me. And when we try to understand why, what was going on, what was happening in that space, right, uh, we realized that there were some really key barriers that were preventing us from not only participating and being involved, but also being successful as innovators and creators and entrepreneurs in this space. So Div Inc's mission is essentially to generate social economic equity through entrepreneurship, right? And our vision essentially is to a world that is authentically inclusive, equitable, and diverse, where social and economic disparities no longer exist. That's heavy. It's heavy. I mean, I'm, I'm squatting, right? <laughs> 650, right? That's heavy. But all of us have to, it, it, it's not just Div Inc., it's, it's all of us. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of excited because I do have, you know, some, some friends here who are 
helping to carry that burden, that heavy lift that we're talking about. Okay? So here's what I had learned, some of the, the key barriers to a success in entrepreneurship. Number one was access to best practices in the education. A lot of folks were coming to me. I was actually an angel investor at the time. And they were coming to me and really didn't understand. Not that I was an entrepreneur expert either, but I did understand the fundamentals of a successful business. So we were missing some fundamentals. We were missing some insights that were really, really critical because making mistakes as entrepreneur, they are costly mistakes, but we got to make them, right? Uh, number two was access to the network and community. Now, I have network up in here, but yesterday I experienced something that I, you know, we, we experience almost you know, every day at Div Inc. But yesterday I attended the New Majority Summit that was put on by 1863 Ventures. Did anybody go to that yesterday? Yeah. Um, Melissa Bradley, who's the founder of 1863 Ventures, is here with us. But yesterday, that community was special. Yeah, it was. Yes, the workshops were outstanding. Melissa dropped some knowledge down on us yesterday and it was incredible. But that community and that network is even more powerful because there were so many people who were founders and CEOs who, did, who were not surrounded by people like themselves to help them become successful. And that community provided that. So let me continue. So access to the network, access to funding. We know access to financial capital does not happen in, in a very robust way. Right, we'll talk about that too. We got a couple of VCs on here. And then also, of course, the gender and racial bias that continues to exist. So Div Inc. basically was born to overcome those barriers for our underrepresented, underserved founders. So since then, we've actually supported 164 founders. Roughly about 55, 60% of these companies are still active today. Right? On the tech startup side. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so very quickly, um, we have a sports tech accelerator that's coming up. The applications are open now. Right? We also do mentor workshops and all of that. So get here. But really what we all came here for was this right here. Right? Preston, you could talk all day if you want to. We ain't here to hear you. <laughs> Be here to hear these folks. But here's what's really key, and this is the reason why I sort of like reached out and called on to these folks. Number one, Afrotech could not have come at a better time. Because we need each other right now, right? <clears throat> Number two, it was really interesting, um, the title of this event, and still I rise. I didn't know that this was going to be the result. Right. <laughs> that right. Part. But, this, you know, and still I rise, that's how every day, no matter what's going on, right, and still we rise. So despite everything that's going on, right, we need to find our way forward, Right? And hopefully we'll be doing some different things. And I want you guys to all walk away with something from today's conversation. I'm going to be sitting front row, taking notes, and I hope you all do too. So just think about it. And still we rise. And still we rise. How do we move forward today together? All right? Are y'all with me? Yes. Okay, what's the title again? And one more time. One more time. Y'all ready? Yes. All right, let's get on with it. Now, I'm going to take a moment to introduce. Let me get, let me, let me get the background up in here. Hold on a second, man. All right, so I'm going to introduce um, Danielle. Danielle and I, we've known each other for, what, two, three years yes. now. Um, she's with J.P. Morgan Chase. She's the Southwest Head of Diverse Businesses 
for J.P. Morgan Middle Market and Specialized Industry, Industries Group in the Commercial Bank. If I had a title like that, people would laugh at me because that's too long. <laughs> She's primarily focused on strategy, execution, business development, and growth in mid-sized, diverse women and veteran-owned businesses throughout eight states in the Southwest segment of the, of the um, country. Danielle started as an intern with inroads at J.P. Morgan 23 right. years ago. Right. It has never looked back. She has been recognized in the last few years by five different Houston-based publications for her influence and leadership in the community. So let me bring up our moderator and dear friend, Danielle Davis, who's going to be moderating the panel. And Wow, I've never heard myself like that. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Well, for one, Right now, my heart is touched uh, by the amount of you that are in here today. So it lets me know that you want to hear what our panelists have to say. And you want to ask questions about the way forward, the way forward that Preston just spoke about. So I'm going to introduce each one of them to come up. So first, I'm going to start with Melissa Bradley. I mean, she doesn't need any type of introduction. Uh, if you are in this world. <laughs> but I'm going to have her come on and sit on up here. Let's give her a clap. I thought her new majority summit yesterday was amazing. I don't, if you missed it, you missed out. That's what I tell people. But her, her background is so extensive. And some of the main things that I love was she is part of the Goldman Sachs One Million Black Women Advisory Council, the Small Business Administration's Investment Capital Advisory Committee, and the National Advisory Council for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. So let's give her one more hand. <laughs> Next up is another person I don't believe needs any type of introduction, Alfonso David. Can you come to the stage, please? <laughs> he is one of the foremost civil rights attorneys and lifelong advocate for social and economic justice. All right, he serves as the president and CEO of the Global Black Economic Forum. Mr. David engages with world leaders, business executives, policymakers, entrepreneurs, activists, and consumers globally. Let's give him another hand. Now, this is an H-Town proud person. Let's bring up, welcome uh, Joshua Taylor to the stage. Please come on up. He is the director of Fifth Star Funds, which is a venture fund focused on investing in unrepresented founders, friends, and family round. So really helping you in that startup stage. And he is also a venture partner at South Loop Ventures, okay? And he is a co-founder of the Texas Black Founders Network. Let's give him a hand, H-Town's on. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Rodney Williams. Please come to the stage, co-founder of Solo Funds. And I don't know if you guys know this, but Solo Funds is the largest community finance platform in the US. Since 2018, it has surpassed 1 million in loans funded and redefined access to capital and returns for 1.5 million users. 1.5 million users. Let's give them another hand. All right, so today is really based on us having a conversation, right, and thinking about that way forward. So I'm going to start with you, Melissa. So your work and your years as a founder and a funder in this space, as well as your education, it's second to none, second to none. So what do you feel is the current state of support for diverse programs and entrepreneurship, and where do you see it headed? Well, we're here, so that's a good start, uh, which means that we have not given up despite what happened on Tuesday. Um, I think there's a couple of factors that I want to talk about. I think you hit it, and I know everybody else will. Just after 2020, we had a spike in funding for black founders. After 2022, it dropped to the lowest levels ever. We have seen greater challenges of mental health amongst founders because of just the straight up racism and microaggressions. Um, I could cite all the challenges, but to the name of the panel, and still we rise. Uh, black women in particular still remain the fastest growing segment of, of entrepreneurs uh, despite all the friction points. And so I think from a community perspective, entrepreneurship doesn't 
change as a wealth creator. However, I think there's two to three things we need to remember. In 1968, there was something called the Kerner Commission Report, and it talked about the fact that America would face its demise if they did not invest in black people. And President Johnson said, so we recognize and know, right, that if this country had invested the way that report talked about, even if we had started post-2020 when Citi came out with that report, we'd actually have a $4 trillion surplus and not the deficit we have. Mm. So first and foremost, we have to own that America is willing to work against its own self-interest in the name of racism. Just own it. Say Don't, that again. America is willing to work against its best interest in the name of racism. Mm. Yeah. So you gotta own that. That doesn't mean there's not some allies or whatever, but systematically you have to understand that is probably not going to change because we've had multiple times to do that. And if anybody has seen the meme going around from DC where the Asian boy is, brother, sorry, is having a dinner or a meal with the white guy who literally said, while I believe in everything you stand for, I voted for Trump because I'm afraid of the less power of my whiteness. I saw that back in 2017, we had that conversation. Yep, so, so we gotta own that. However, I think the, the other piece though is that what we have seen is an increase in wealth amongst the black community. And so we just need to help our own. This is no different than what we saw with Tulsa. This is no different than what we've seen in other places where it's just up to us, right? So, uh, President, I say for us, by us. We just need to go back to the basics. And, and so I would say that there's three things I think founders need to think about and two things that investors need to think about. One is that you gotta stay the course. I will call you out and say, we have over 50 investments in our portfolio and those were hard found because our founders are not showing up correctly. As I said yesterday, just because you can doesn't mean you should. The second thing is, do not sign up for yet another program that does not talk about managing your numbers because I cannot invest in someone who can pitch but who cannot add, subtract, or forecast. Please say that okay. again because that's for me. I just JP can't. Morgan, I just can't. Uh, <laughs> and, and the third thing is, we have to recognize that if one of us is successful, that's not good enough. I have the privilege to know Rodney. It's not good enough that Rodney says, well, it's success because he brings everybody along. And so if one of you in this room is make it, you better reach your ass back and get somebody else. And from an investor side, I would say a couple things. One, we, as, as part of my role, I'm a professor at Georgetown as well as a VC, and we're working on a research paper that'll come out in December that talks about that we need to adjust the five C's of capital, and we need to add two more. Mm -hmm. One is culture, and one is community. Because people do not understand the economic value that exists when you think about business like Rodney or anybody, for example, the New Voices portfolio. So just be able to make sure that you know your worth and that you bring that data to investors because we live and die on numbers. The other thing that I would say to investors is check yourself. You have a fiduciary duty to make good investments, which means that your risk tolerance needs to be slightly more subjective than objective, and you need to delete your racist biases from every time you take a look at a deal from somebody who looks like me. <laughs> you dropped so many gems. I can't even recap. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, wow. Right. So, Alfonso, I'm going to go to you next. Um, so, we have all read and heard about lawsuits and attacks on venture capital funds focused on diverse and women-owned businesses. Hopefully, you can help make some sense of it all and make it more clear for a lot of the different allegations. So, I'll ask you this question to start. What have you seen from a legal and regulatory perspective when it comes to accelerator programs or how VCs operate? Today or moving forward? Or today. Both? And then you can go into the move forward, but today. Um, okay, so let me give you the 360 degree framework of what's happening out there. We have organizations that are incredibly well-funded, and the goal is to eliminate every race-conscious program in this country, mm. period. Whether it be race-conscious or, you know, race-specific, any race-conscious or race-specific program, the goal is to eliminate it in every federal law, in every federal regulation, in every federal policy. So what they have done, very strategically, is to file as many lawsuits as possible 
in certain districts that they believe they're more inclined to win in in order to change the law. Hmm. I had the privilege of representing the Fearless Fund in federal court. Uh, two women worked over the course of several years to try to get funding for their business ventures and they kept on getting denial after denial after denial. So they opened up the Fearless Fund about five, six years ago. The Fearless Fund is both a venture capital firm as well as a charitable organization. So the venture capital firm was looking to invest in other black and brown businesses that were facing obstacles getting funding. In addition, they opened up a charitable organization to provide grants to black and brown businesses across the country. And they have been doing this successfully for years. Um, last August, they received a, a, a complaint, federal, criminal com uh, federal civil complaint, essentially saying that one of their programs, which provided grants to black women, violated federal law. Now, some of you may know the story, but I think it's important for everybody to appreciate what this case is. The argument was, by providing grants to black women, you violate federal law. <laughs> so just another attack just on it, Just again. it with that. <laughs> now, the reason why that's so absurd is because in the venture capital space, there's $288 billion that's allocated every year. Mm. With a B, $288 billion. And of the $288 billion, less than 1% goes to black people. Less than 0.036% goes to black women. Mm. No one disputes the data. But they're still saying, by engaging in self-help, you violate federal law. And they're using a statute that was passed in 1866. Mm -hmm. During Reconstruction, this law was passed to allow us to enter into contracts. Prior to Reconstruction, we were considered property. We couldn't get an education. We couldn't enter into contracts. So this law was passed to allow us to enter into contracts the same way that white people can enter into contracts. The argument is by only providing grants to black women, you violate this law because it's not available to white women. And so we defended them in federal court and we won at the district court level on a number of different grounds. Right. Um, the main argument that we advanced was this is a charitable organization. They're providing grants consistent with their mission. What about all of the other charitable organizations that exist out there? The Italian American organization, the Jewish organization, the Irish organization, and they all provide grants only to one specific demographic group. Why is it that this grant is unlawful and their grants is permissible? And the court said, you're right. We have a First Amendment. That First Amendment applies to charitable organizations. And so we made a number of different arguments, but sort of taking this to where we are now, mm -hmm. and the reason why this is important, even though we wanted the district court, it was appealed. Mm. It was appealed to the 11th Circuit. There are 12 judges on the 11th Circuit. We know who those 12 are. We know who those 12 judges are. <laughs> Three judges heard the appeal. Two of the judges were appointed by now President-elect Trump, and one was appointed by President Obama. The two judges that were appointed by uh, now-elect uh, President Trump concluded that the district court was wrong. <laughs> now, the reason why that should be concerning to all of you <laughs> right. is because this was a charitable organization providing grants consistent with their mission. And there was case law in the 11th Circuit that was binding, the court ignored it. What is also concerning is the lawsuit was filed by an organization claiming that three of their members were being discriminated against. Problem is, we don't know who they are. They're anonymous. They're anonymous. We don't know if they're legitimate business owners. We don't know if they're real. And the court still said they had standing to sue. So when we talk about elections having consequences, 
understand that in the 11th circuit, you can have anonymous plaintiffs go in and try to shut down your business, mm. but in the second circuit, which is New York, you can't do that. That's right. That's why election has, has have consequences. So as we think about the landscape for venture capitalism, for entrepreneurship, for investors, just understand that as a black and brown investor or as a black and brown entrepreneur, the rules unfortunately apply differently to us. And so we have to constantly think about being more creative, and thinking about how we utilize the law to support ourselves. Because my argument is this, there are three buckets. Bucket number one is, well, we don't want to give you government funding because we think that it's unfair, right? This is the ultra right wing argument. No government funding, fine, no government funding. Then you say, well, no government funding and you can't engage in self-help. Well, if I can't engage in, if I can't receive government funding and you're saying I can't go out to help my own community and you're not denying the disparities that exist, then what you're telling me is you want me to stay in my seat. Right. What you're saying is you don't care about the disparities because you're taking away the solutions. And that is the landscape that we currently operate in. It's complicated. Yeah. I would say there are a few guiding principles. One, invest in your community. $288 billion, we're getting less than 1%. 85% of the businesses that are registered in this country are white. 85%, and they generate more than 93% of the revenues. Mm. By contrast, one, three percent of the businesses are black and they generate only one percent of the business revenues. So we have to think about how we invest in our own community, that's one. Two, we have to utilize networks like this. Understand that all of you here are targets. All of you individually are targets. What you put on your website, how you talk about your work, what you say about your work publicly makes you a target. So utilizing networks like this is critically important. And I would say finally, I've spoken to a lot of folks who have not had the opportunity to engage with legal counsel. Mm -hmm. That is so important. It's so important because you may think that you're posting something on your website that's fairly innocuous but it exposes you because you use the wrong language, right? Because 83% of the companies are still supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, but they don't want to use the word DEI. No, they want to use words like inclusive. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Or belonging. Right, belonging. <laughs> so be mindful of how you're characterizing your business, what you're saying about your investments, and you can utilize the legal networks that exist either at the Global Black Economic Forum, at Freedom Economy, I'm working with them, I'm working with Melissa's group, I'm working with New Ventures, um, New Voices, uh, I should say Foundation. Make sure that you're utilizing the networks that exist. You should not go into this alone. So if you do those three things, invest in our community, make sure that you're utilizing the existing networks that exist, and also seek our legal counsel would be better positioned to defend the work that we're doing. Wow, let's give him a hand. And by the way, it's oh, free. Okay. Just so we're clear, we litigated the Fearless Fund case and I created a, a cohort of lawyers, brought in Gibson Dunn, a large international law firm, brought in Ben Crump, brought in the NAACP LDAF, brought in the Women's Law Center as consulting attorneys, they all did it for free. Mm. So there is no excuse. No, so if you are targeted, pick up the phone. There is a network out here looking to provide support for you to continue to do the work. Wow, let's give him a hand. So many, so many jewels dropped. Okay, so let me go over here to my VC fellas. 
run VCs. So Sheesh. as they've already mentioned, right, one to two percent of venture capital and funding goes to women and diverse owned companies, less than half a percent to black owned companies. We know that that's the stat. And I tell people all the time, the number is the number. So now what are you going to do? Right. You know this. Yeah. So what do you feel investors and stakeholders can do to continue to support diversity and entrepreneurship? We can start with you, Josh. Yeah. Well, the great smart gentleman right there just said part of it. Um, I think it's twofold. Number one, on the investment side, we have to do more collaboration. I know we do. Um, but a lot of it, we have a fiduciary duty to return capital to shareholders. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think about that, it's like a frenemy type of thing where I might share you a deal, but it may not be my best deal. Mm. And also on the flip side, that's who I trust. So you're going to do business with who you trust, who you want to invest with, right? You know, Melissa and I just met, but we don't really know each other yet, mm -hmm. right? But as you that need trust, to know. Yeah, for sure. I, I, peep, <laughs> I peeped game yesterday. <laughs> but as we get to know each other and I show her hopefully quality deals, I, I focus on friendly and friends founders, so MVP stage. So I have to give her great founders and ideas that she'll want to look at and be like, oh, this, this is a dope pre-seed or seed deal that I actually want to look at. Right, so I think building that trust is really important, and having more conversations with our communities, it's really easy that hey, I'm a, I'm gonna go grind and do my own thing and go on the hole. But what are you gonna do to pick yourself up out of that hole? Like Rodney's, he's pretty successful, very successful, right? He's already doing the work, but we need more Rodneys. We need more people on each side of the aisle. So I think a lot of I'll commend a lot of the black focused funds, diverse focused funds are doing the work. Um, I think we have. I mean, I get hit up by a lot of founders every single day in my LinkedIn. They are doing the work. I just think we need more community. Um, but I'll also say, not just on the capital side, just on the community side and building together, like, we're, like, it's, it's dire. Um, we need us more than ever, right? And still we rise. I think we talk about enough, a lot. But, like, until we really, I think this election and whatever your viewpoint is about it, it showed that we have no one's coming to save us. And so from a venture perspective on the numbers, right, I think everybody on the investment side and the founder side has to step up their game, right? Even without an MVP, it's hard for us to give you, even for us to give you a $25,000 check because I'm trying to get to 1863. I'm trying to get the founders, you know, to the South Loops, to the, you know, uh, Mac Venture Capitals and Slossons and so on and so on. And so I think that's what founders can do to help. Investors just have to keep collaborating, keep doing community, keep being together. Awesome. Now, what do you think, Rodney? What's your viewpoint on it? Uh, number one, hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, my viewpoint, obviously, I'm a founder. I think, I, I think we're all founders. I, I like to not separate myself because um, yes. we're all building things that I think we're passionate about. I think that, you know, entering into tech, in 2012 and to see it today, I think number one, I actually think, you know, minorities in tech have done a great job building that ecosystem. Because I remember when the ecosystem was tiny. Right. And, uh, and there weren't rooms like this. Afrotech was this room by itself. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what the first Afrotech looked like. So I'm, I'm incredibly excited about this community. I'm excited about New Voices family and the investors and the VCs that also look like me today, because in 2012, they did not look like me. Mm -mm. Um, so for, I think the one thing that I would say to, to all uh, folks in this community, um, I do think there needs to be the next phase. What I'm, what I'm trying to identify is that there's key founders within tech that are incredible. And they're incredible over and over again. Um, and they're starting to hit ceilings. Ceilings of network, ceilings of what they need to learn, and most important, capitalization, right? There's so much venture capital activity, so much accelerated activity at the seed level. And then as you kind of go from the C to the A to B to C, um, you, can, you get lonely again. And all of a sudden, I'm lonely again. I'm back to where I was in 2012. With a, with a lonely group of founders who actually really, 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 really need this entire community again. So that's the, that's the message that I would say. You just said something I want to go a little bit deeper on about how, how do we get to that next level? 
from that seed to that, those A, B, C rounds? How do, I, how do you get to those level? Um, I can just tell you my story. Yes. I mean, I did it twice. I did it twice. three times. So three we times. need to hear from you. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm from Baltimore. I started my career in, uh, in, uh, at Procter & Gamble in brand management. And while I was at Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati, Ohio, I decided to go into tech. Um, I started my first company uh, called um, Listener, which is still active to this day. Mm -hmm. um, raised about $50 million. Um, and that journey was out of Cincinnati, Ohio. You know, at the time, I raised a million dollars out of that community. Um, no one looked like myself. There was never anybody else around like me. And I traveled the world looking for VCs. Mm. Literally, I lived in Berlin for three months. I traveled to Africa. I was in, I got an investor out of Tokyo. If there was someone that was willing to talk to me about funding my dream, you got a conversation with me. And I pushed it through. I mean, that was the only way. I don't think that I always had the right answers. I'm also, I would never say I'm the brightest, but what I will say, very much like a lot of founders that I've seen push through, is that we want it more, and that ability will always allow me to outlearn someone. And I have a lot of confidence in that. So I think we need more investors just, I mean, excuse me, we need more founders being comfortable, not knowing everything but being very confident that you can learn it and you should and you will. And go find the folks that want to support you. Um, the second time around was easier and the third time around was easiest, right? Right, it um, gets easier each time. Yeah, but you get new problems. You know, back to being a target, my first two companies, solo funds became a target. Mm. And that was something I wasn't used to understanding. I, I came from the, I guess the, the rule book of like, you get good grades, you get the, the, the sticker in class. That's, that's all I care about is I want the sticker in class. So I got good grades, meaning the company was performing incredibly well. You know, a, a lot of our leaders said, hey, we want founders to come and, and close the wealth gap. We want founders to come and build uh, financial products that are more inclusive. I said, okay, I stood up. I left my first company and said, I'm gonna build something that's gonna help my community. Solo allows people like you to lend and borrow from each other for basic necessities, things like keeping your lights on or paying a utility bill. It's designed to address a $300 billion industry called subprime lending, which is dominated by credit cards and payday loans, which you can get a license to charge those fees to do. Hurts our communities um, systematically, and if you study it, it's one of the key drivers of disproportionate um, expenses, yep. meaning that we take on the burden of the fee structure in those um, particular segments. So I wanted to create a new product. Steps in entering that market, being successful in that market, we became a target. Mm. And the lawsuits, and the lawsuits, and the lawsuits. So basically what Alfonso was talking about over here. What Alfonso was saying. <laughs> Um, and, I, and I go back to what Alfonso was saying, and I also go back to what I just mentioned. I'm starting to think that, and I truly believe this, back to how I got here, the only way is to push through and with the help of everyone in this room. I don't think the recipe changes. I think more so than ever, everyone should know the black companies in tech, the, the, the companies that are doing well, trying to change the, the narrative, trying to create more inclusive products. And we need your support more so than ever, and, and ever before, I think. And I think the next four years is gonna be a, a tale of how well we either come together and support each other. Because really, we don't need <laughs> them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you repeat that. <laughs> We, we don't need them. I, I talk about, you know, we're at two million users. If, if I had, you know, one, you know, a few percentage points of people that look like me on my, on my platform, number one, it, we, could, we can go IPO. Right. And, and, and turn this into a real unicorn, just like that. Yeah. We have so much power that I think um, I, I want to unlock in a, in, a, in a useful way. Wow. Please give her a hand. I didn't know you was gonna go that deep from just me thinking of a question to ask from what you said. I love it. So Melissa, I'm gonna go back over to you. So it'll tell 
you know, go right into uh, our conversation about next administrations, right? I know you've worked in the administration of Presidents Clinton and Obama, right? In the Office of Thrift Supervision and the White House Social Innovation Fund, respectively. So, how have you seen support change between administrations in the past? And what do you think we can expect given the last Trump administration? Uh oh. Thank you. Well, the last told me we needed to go deep. So the, the last Trump administration, I lived on Capitol Hill, and we moved quickly thereafter. Mm. Um, you know, I think that historically there has been a respect for democracy, respect mm. for governance in this country, mm. and I think that all changed. Um, and I and I want to call out that that changed. And what we're seeing changing is the fact that, as many of you know, I do not use the word minority because it is inaccurate. We are the new majority. The demographic shifts are happening. We are the majority. And in the world of entrepreneurship, we are the majority. So things get funky when people are fearful. Uh, and although I think this transition will be smooth because this fool ain't got nothing to be fearful about. He runs the house. The Senate, you are much more eloquent. The Supreme Court, what you got to worry about? You in charge, right? You the HWIC. And so I think that it'll be a smooth transition, but I think that there will be some missteps because of arrogance. Mm. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I learned, many things obviously served between Clinton and Obama, but if you recall, once Obama got health care passed, that was it. We got nothing else passed. We, we didn't even need to go down to Capitol Hill because they were like, we're not talking to you. And one of the things that I realized that we learned, and I'm hoping that this subsequent administration did, is that there's a lot more you can do inside of agencies than you can on the Hill. Gotcha. During Obama, there were things that as part of uh, various initiatives, particularly My Brother's Keeper, there used to be a time when if you were a child and you were sent away to prison or a similar delinquent facility, your academic records would be locked up. And in order for you to get re-educated, it would be like, why bother? We created a policy within that agency that that is no longer possible. That local schools have to be able to keep your records and keep you as an active student, including if you take educational classes while you happen to be put away for a second. Which is huge because we know education changes the trajectory. My sense is that this fool is not smart enough to dig deep. <laughs> and so where, from the Obama administration to the Biden administration has been smart enough to put policies there's really not a lot that can be done because they're not paying attention to that stuff. Or they're going after the big hits and not the small wins that we've had. The other thing I think that we have to recognize is that the stigma and, and, the, and the rhetoric that we are the largest users of certain social programs, do you know that 37% of welfare recipients are white people? Right. We only in the 20s. So while I don't think that welfare is our highest standard, right. I think that we have to acknowledge there'll be some things that have been part of our safety net that will remain for no other reason than he believes it will help white people. And so we need to take advantage of that. And I think that that then carries over to other programs where white people have benefited. I do not ever believe there will be attack on venture capital. If you listen to Alfonso, there was never an attack on venture capital. It was an attack on a grant program. Yeah. Uh, there is no way in hell he's going to attack venture capital because it's all white people. Like we ain't got that much, right. and so I think we. And that's not a oh three six for black women. I mean, but and that's not a great thing. But I think that's where we become opportunistic. Right. Right. That's where we realize we have leverage, and that's where we zone in. Stop trying to do every damn thing, but where are the positions of leverage that will lead to power that we need to focus on? Um, so I think it will be smooth. I think it will happen. I think, like myself, many of you may start carrying your passport in your pocket, um, just in case. I, I'm from the United States. So. But just in case, because you know, depending on whether you got a tan or not, you may get stopped. We have no idea how this mass deportation is going to go. That part. So I do think that we need to remain vigilant and, and, and look out for each other. We need to be each other's keeper. Um, I think the second thing is that we have to start now. I, I have run into a lot of people who are just like, well, we lost. Okay, well, that was, you got that overnight, right? That was a happy hour. But we have an election in two years that could literally transform everything if we don't focus on the presidency but focus on the House and the Senate. Right. And so I think that what we saw in terms of mass turnout and grassroots campaign, it needs to come back, and we need to encourage those young people in particular to come back and say, this is not the end. We need to stop operating on four-year cycles and focus on 
two-year cycles. Um, and then the final thing I would say is, I, I, it'll be interesting, and I really defer to Alfonso, but I, I would like to believe, maybe it's in my own storybook, that the lawsuits will go away because they think they won. They think they won, which again gives us an opportunity if they've taken, if, if the focus is no longer us and how do you hold us down, and the focus becomes how do you uplift the white people, then what an amazing opportunity for us to collectively decide what do we do next that is bigger and better. Let's be clear, we are not where we are because white people are better, faster, smarter. We are where we are because we're not operating collectively. And I think that that means, and I'm a, I'm gonna be a little vulnerable here, so don't be throwing shit at me, okay? <laughs> don't be throwing, because I think Rodney's in the same boat, and, I think, but, and you probably in the same boat, so I'm gonna be willing to say it, so don't be throwing shit. Some of us are better off financially when Trump was in office. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. However, that's where we have to stop acting in our own self-interest right. and realize if I'm okay, but right. my brother and sister are okay, then we are not okay. That is fact. That is fact. I would definitely say that. I told someone that very same thing. I, that applying to me, this is my overall community that I'm worried about. Um, I'll find next. So for companies, sometimes diversity, equity, and inclusion work is a matter of compliance. Uh, for others, it's a matter of building a culture of inclusion and belonging, like you mentioned earlier. So how have you seen corporations and foundations changing their support or messaging for diversity and entrepreneurship? What have you seen? So um, a few things there. Yeah. The data shows that 83% of companies are still supporting diversity initiatives. 83%, but you wouldn't know that from reading the newspaper. Because what we see is X company, Tractor Supply is dropping diversity, equity, and inclusion. Harley Davidson is dropping d diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there's this drumbeat that suggests that diversity, equity, and inclusion not only is dead, but in substance, diversity, equity, and inclusion is essentially providing benefits to unqualified people. Right. So those are the two goals of the attacks, to suggest that diversity, equity, and inclusion is dead, and the second to suggest that even if it exists, it's providing jobs to people who are not qualified for those jobs. Both are false, mm -hmm. right? Diversity continues, and the reason why is because we have data for decades that shows that if you have a diverse workforce, you have higher revenues, yep. and you have greater innovation. So if I'm the CEO of a company and I see the data, whether it be Harvard or McKinsey, it's the same report each and every time showing that if you have more women and racial groups within your C-suite, you will be the company of the future. If I'm a CEO, why would I reject that? So what we're seeing is companies that continue to advance inclusion programs, they just call it something different, right? They're not calling it diversity, equity, and inclusion because they don't want to be on the front page of the newspaper. And what they also recognize is that consumers are saying at the, at the rate of 90 plus percent, especially the younger generation of consumers, that they will only support companies that are embracing inclusive policies. Now, the, the trick and the challenge here is we don't have a lot of data that shows how that's manifesting. Mm. Right? We're not seeing how the boycotts are reflecting on companies that are taking a step back from diversity, equity, and inclusion. But we're seeing the studies where consumers are saying, look, if you take a step back, I'm no longer going to support your company. So it's a mixed bag, but I think ultimately we have to separate the noise from the facts. And if you see a headline that says X company is taking a step back, one, in most cases, they don't know what that means. Mm. I've spoken to enough CEOs and you know, senior VPs that will say the change that we made is rather innocuous. We're actually still doing the work, but we can't say that publicly <laughs> because they don't want to get attacked. Yeah. So you're seeing this narrative advanced 
that suggests that it's over when in fact it's not. One point that I just want to highlight um, in, or piggyback in terms of what Melissa says. You have to appreciate that we are a threat just by existing. Mm. Just by existing because we're not supposed to be here. We're not supposed to be here, so that's one. Two, when you thrive, you gain power. The fact that Rodney has done this three times makes him more of a threat. Right. So one, you're not supposed to be here. Two, when you succeed, you become more of a threat. And I would say third, when you fight back alone, you will lose. Mm. And that's why it's so important for us to collaborate here. Because when we talk about the narrative that is being advanced against us, it's strong. But it's not real. And we have to think about how we more artfully and strategically fight back. Wow. All right, so I'm gonna go over here to you guys, and this is our last question, and I'll open it up to everyone, but we'll, we'll start over here. Um, to end on a light note, uh, looking towards that future that we talked about, um, what initiatives and what people are you excited about that things that are coming soon? If you think about uh, here in H-Town or throughout the United States of programming and, and people that we wanna be looking out for it. See? Yeah, Fifth Star Funds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's James we're a philanthropic, it we're a philanthropic it. fund. So just like Dev Inc., we're, we're donation based. Um, but all, all jokes aside, I was serious, but all that aside, I think, mm -hmm. um, I think more at a macro level, it is about the community, it's about group economics, like really using solo funds, really finding, going to Afrotech and Blavity hey, who are the movers and shakers that are building companies? Who could I buy from as black? I know that's been hard to do at scale, but we have to take the extra effort um, to do those things. And so I make it a point to read Afrotech every day and look at who, who's coming up, who's on the, my job is to find founders, but more importantly, to look at who's doing things, even if it's not venture scale, right? Who could I look at? Uh, Tech Fest Live, Khalil, yeah. raise your hand, man, stand up. Stand up, bro. Yeah. It's, it's about the pipeline. Khalil is my buddy, too. Yeah, that's my dog. Yeah. So what TextFest Live is doing, um, if you're a corporate, you should be talking to him. Um, it's really helping our pipeline here in Houston. Um, I think he should be more in Houston, more than just Houston. Um, but being able to help our, our students here, he had two, over 2,000 students um, at U of H in the technology bridge learning about the future. Right, yep. having speakers from all different startups and corporations, um, different type of technologies, hardware and software. So it starts in our youth, right? It's Gen Z, it's Generation Alpha, it's the next, right? Um, and then it's with us as an adult saying, hey, if I'm an accredited investor or non-accredited, how can I start to invest in black focused things? Right, I get it. We love the Gucci. We love the Prada. You don't call me out now. Uh, uh, hey, I get it. <laughs> I'm here. I, Mavado, right? We love you know those brands, but like that's not us, right? What about the black focused brands, right? I know it's hard to do at scale, but we can do it locally, right? Which can scale globally, mm -hmm. right? I think across the diaspora as well. I'm super gun ho about the diaspora. That's part of my life's work. Um, it's focusing on us. That's why I joined Fifth Star Funds and love Dev Inc. personally um, as when I was an entrepreneur in residence. Um, but across the diaspora, there's a real convergence of us being able to build digitally as well as phys physically. And so startups like Afropolitan um, by my boy Eche, he, I don't think he's here, but he's around. Um, they're, they're trying, they're, what they're working on is building a digital nation for the African diaspora. There's over 150 million of us, right? We're a nation, right? Like Rodney said, all we got is us. That's all we need. Literally, with our buying power, that's all we need. And so we just start to focus on that locally and globally, just slowly start to transition those dollars, start to invest in those things that are black, right? And see how we could financially educate ourselves and in the classroom and all the different things 
Um, I think I think that could be great. I think lastly, I just thought about this. I think in our a lot of us have a lot of different family circumstances, but I think it really goes down to your community, your core community, who you hang out with, who you go to every day. Everybody has different family structures, right? But I think it goes down to our communities, right? Post civil rights, we saw the decline of our families go down, right? I think we need to reinvigorate what our communities look like. It may not be the church anymore. Maybe that's not the center of our community. What does it look like for us to build our communities back, right? We're segregated across, or desegregated, I think, I'm gonna say it, I think desegregation was a mistake. Um, yes. <laughs> that's a whole nother panel of conversation. <laughs> yeah, I've been having a lot of conversations post November 5th about that. Um, but it's 2025. We can do it. We don't have to be in the same place. Just if you're a Fortune 500 board member, executive, or you live in the trenches, like we got to find ways we could all work together because that capital is being segregated. Before, 50, 60 years ago, it was together. That's true. But we had a brain drain. And so moving on up, moving on up, like the Joneses, you want to live and be with them, which is cool. You live in a better neighborhood, whoop de whoop But look where it's gotten us as a whole, right? It's not about just our wealth individually. Most of y'all in here are going to get yours regardless. Y'all going to be straight. But the number is still going to be the same. And then we're like, oh my god, what's wrong? Well. We're not feeding back into everybody. So it's got to be within your own home. Everyone has different home structures. How can we do it locally? And then how can we scale it globally? That's my, that's my thoughts. So, Brian, what do you think? I'm going to try to put it all together because uh, it's something I've been thinking about. I think when we're talking about building community, um, I'm going to tell you what I think it means. And I hope you guys take it away. Um, there's no one that looks like yourself or myself that is a competitor or we're against each other. Mm. Like, like, that's number mm. one. Like, loyalty to each other over everything. Absolutely everything. Because you got to understand, every one person or group that looks like you, that you point and say, maybe I'm better, even Diddy, it hurts us all. Like. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. I can only tell you what it feels like when you walk into a room and the last thing they saw was a negative article by Diddy and they talked to me. Right. I indirectly take on his burden. Yep. So I actually don't want him to lose. Right. You know? For sure. So, but that's what loyalty means. My organics. Um, I know everyone was upset about the hair. Like, why do we want to take that down? Right. That's not the competitor that you want to take down. There is nothing that that company can do wrong for me to not buy it. You know how many other products have hurt us? I'm the same one. So loyalty over everything when it comes to people that look like yourself. That if we have products, if you have businesses, support each other. I do have to do a selfish plug. <laughs> Our wealth gap continues to get white. Uh, one of the key factors is that um, their savings, their net worth grows disproportionately um, greater than ours. The, the magic number I want to tell you is that every year your wealth should grow by 20%. The, the way you want to simply think about this is that if you have money in the bank, it needs to grow by 20%. They actually track most billionaires and, and most you know, folks that make over a certain amount of money. And you can see they average somewhere between 20 to 40% net worth growth every year. So you gotta understand if you're not pacing at that level, you're losing, mm. okay? So then you're like, okay, so how do I do that systematically? What Solo does, two parts. One part, people who need access to capital can set their own terms. The way they set that is tips and donations. There's no mandated fee structure. Just like you and I, you can look at who needs funds and you can decide who to fund and you make tips. Those tips accrue and can be well over 50% annually. The average lender on our platform, who looks like you and I, is averaging over 50% APY annually. The, mm. 
Um, we've outpaced every investment product, and it's a product that you can, you can lend as little as $20, and you get it back in two weeks. There's, not, there's no other investment product so flexible and for, the, for the working class individual person. Like, that's, there's nothing like it before. I'm gonna tell you something else that I don't like. The majority of the lenders on our platform are white males. Mm. Yep. Mm. 1.5 million users, right? What's the problem? <laughs> that, that upsets me. So mm. everybody on this, in this room should be a lender on my platform, or if you need capital, you should make a request. But the point is, is that you, you, you can't talk about group economics and not support the literally number one example of it ever in the history of the United States. Right. <laughs> okay? So I had to. Um, oh, but if you just do those two things, don't leave Mayo alone and support solo funds, I'm happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll let these two get some final words and then that will be it. Okay, she just here. Kiki, close. No, that's true. <laughs> so I just want to build upon what you said, right? I think, of, I think what has happened is that we as black people have come into a level of privilege that has allowed us to level up the oneness and be comfortable of being the only one in a room, in a space, in an industry. And there is, I'm not a scientist, but I spend time with some, there is much more value in collective than dispersed. Okay, you clap it now, but wait to the next part. Which means that some of us need to stop doing what we're doing. No disrespect, but how many more accelerator programs do we need? <laughs> no disrespect, but how many more nonprofits do we need that are vulnerable to the whims of wealthy white people for our survival? I believe everything can have a financial business model. How many more people do we need to say, I'm in charge, I am the HNIC, but you ain't got no friggin' following? We have to begin to think outside of ourselves and think about the betterment of the collective good. Because I am very clear that while I buy white brands and black brands, I'm able to do that because of the collective sacrifice that my mom made and right. many other people made. That's right. And so how dare we throw away what I have heard some of my ancestors say that we are their wildest dreams. Let us not disappoint them. That's right. And let us not disappoint the generation that comes after us because it ain't all about us. All right. Um, I'll close by saying the most important thing I think we can all focus on moving forward is resilience. The next four years, and maybe more, let's just sit in it. The next four years, and maybe more, is going to be challenging. There's going to be a lot of noise. There's going to be a lot of gaslighting. There will be a lot of surprises. I already know what some of those surprises are going to be. And what we need to make sure that we don't do is react. Because we have to keep our eyes on the prize. The goal is to distract you from what we're actually trying to do. And the next four years will make it that much more difficult to do what we're trying to do, which is to build a community of power. So just so we are clear about the assignment for the next four, maybe more years, is we have to continue to be resilient. There will be pieces of legislation that will be advanced that you will wake up one morning and say, they can't do that. <laughs> And they will. And we will be in court making the arguments. Where it ends up, who knows? We have to make sure that we tap into that spirit that we know exists in all of us, vis-a-vis -vis our ancestors, whether we're talking about Harriet Tubman or James Baldwin. We have to make sure that we're tapping into that spirit that will keep us going and keeping our eyes on the prize, because they will not be easy 
And I think it's important for us to recognize that now before we're surprised in six months, in three months, in two months. Don't be surprised. Their part. Let's make sure we keep our eyes on the prize and not be surprised. Mm -hmm. yes. Wow. Why don't we give our panelists a hand? I don't know about you guys, and I didn't see that one person get up and leave, but this is one of the best panels that I've ever been a moderator of. I thank Div Inc. for giving me that honor uh, to do that today. And I think we're going to have two questions. Two questions. Oh, one. oh no, uh, 20 hands <laughs> popped up. Can I take this? I'll switch. Just kidding. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. You tell me where I'm going. I'm going to start right here. The young lady. Mm hmm. Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> so, so, first of all, amazing talk today. Thank you yes. for the opportunity to sit and learn and listen from you. Um, I'm Kiana Barry. I'm a product leader, community builder. I'm also a founder of Apple Adventures, an exclusive orange community of BIPOC innovators, remote workers, and nomads across the 150 million guys for our we not just about upscaling, but both building and investing, and also giving back to those communities that we see in the world. I'm also a founder of Trust Technique. We're building it here at Texas platform, capitalizing off the million black hair care market, which our MVP got 30 million views and over a thousand signups on wait lists. As a board bank community founder and corporate product leader, I promise the question is coming. <laughs> yeah, girl, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm waiting. tired. I am tired that I, like many women, need to be extraordinary just to be seen, only to then become a target for daring to step out the home. So my question is, what can we do to build in public without becoming a public target? I want to just thank you all again for all your work to elevate black and brown communities, and especially black women. I thank you for helping us carry the burden that we carry. And I truly believe that it's only in our unity will our community chart pass forward. For everyone listening today, I'm going to need for us to buy black, think black, invest black, sponsor black, build black, because no, we ain't going back. Okay, so you said, let me make sure I got the question. What can we do as a public to create our own public? Is that what you said? No, how do you build a public without that becoming a, a target. target? Without becoming a target. Okay, how do you build a public without becoming a target? Anybody want to take it? Okay. <laughs> so, so the one thing that I find um, is that it's easier to dispute beliefs than it is to dispute facts. And so one of the things that, I mean, I'll say almost any damn thing, because what do I care? And luckily so far, I mean, partly because I live in DC, but I haven't been a target because I'm not saying anything that's not true. That I have data to back up everything that I say. And so I think we have to have a level of discipline in our rhetoric of not going half cocked and bringing out with emotion, but leading with the data that talks about what is good about us as black people, what have been the challenges that have happened as black people, and what is the opportunity cost of the oppression of black people. Anybody else? I, I think it was something that was also mentioned. Um, when, when you see, for example, the wealth gap. I understand that it is a black problem, and but it is actually a, a human problem. Right. It's a working class problem. It's a white person problem as well. And I think if you if you are attacking a problem, or um, you're, you've created a solution that you believe is going to be as big as it will be, you you will be a target. Yes. And I think the the point is though, when you become a target, I do think it's important to. Um, connect to the human insight of what you're trying to do. And I think once, you, once people understand that it's a shared problem, it's like welfare. Welfare is not going anywhere because it's a shared problem. I understand that we disproportionately benefit potentially, I don't know. No, no, remember white people are no. poor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 37%. Um, but, you know, if you were building a platform for welfare because maybe you had a personal experience and, and you wanted to address it in your specific community, that's your own. I think the greater message is a human message. The same thing with solar funds. You won't see anything about, you know, this community's wealth gap, even though it's a personal passion of mine. What we're trying to do is systematically change the wealth gap of the working class globally. I just know that that will disproportionately also help people that look like myself. That's right. That's right. Yeah, sure. 
So let me give you, think about affirmative action. <laughs> affirmative action is no longer permissible what? in education, right? That's the example. Supreme Court said no more affirmative action. The collateral implications of that are black and brown girls and black and brown boys no longer want to say the word black and brown mm -hmm. in a college application. And so we end up devaluing our identity. That's what affirmative action is about. Getting us to appreciate or devalue who we are as people. Not ignoring the data that shows that we're still being denied opportunities despite the fact that we're qualified. The collateral impact is to devalue our identity. So you're already all targets. When the lawsuit comes, just understand that it's not what you think it's about. <laughs> it's about something different. You're just being used as a conduit to get to that thing. And I think, once again, these networks and making sure that you have legal support that exists will make sure that you can be public without being a target. That's why the Fearless Fund continues to do what they're doing. Right. That's why they just announced a $200 million debt fund. Yep. Now the goal was to shut down the Fearless Fund, but they're still alive and kicking. And they're coming back strong. And they're coming back strong. So that's the point of if you're going to be public, we're already targets. Yep. It's just we have to make sure that when they target you, we're all there to support you. Yeah. We still got time for one more? I'm going to choose you right here because you've been waiting patiently. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I got a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so, no doubt, no doubt. So, um, so, so, I, so I, I really, I, 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 I kind of, you know, I, I'm familiar with everybody's work on this, on this stage. Um, but, the, but there's a large portion of our community that may not be familiar with solar phones and funds, and that may be, and those people in turn become that, that group that can double the, the, the rate of adoption mm -hmm. of your platform. And there's a, there's a, I'm, a, I'm a political scientist, and there was this, this concept called the pedagogy of the oppressed. And I want to ask a question to the panel. Do you believe the metrics by which we deploy capital and allocate jobs are, di are built within a white supremacist framework and are disavowing us from engaging with the broader public that looks like us. We talk about diversity, but true diversity is diversity of thought. One in three black men have been in prison. How many people in from prison are you hiring? We have single mothers that have solutions and they have and they've been able to overcome so much, but they may have dropped out of high school. How many of them are you embedding within your companies? Only seven percent of black people reach the managerial level at Fortune 500 companies like Procter and Campbell, only 1% the CEO level. But we look at these people that worked at the Googles and the Amazons and this and that as if they accomplished something. But President Obama recently said something really, really great. He talked about how nobody is really that smart. It's all about exposure. And are we, are we not exposing those people? And what are you doing to actually expose people that have a broader experience than those of which led you guys all to where you are here today? Do you want to start? Go right here. Do you remember the question? <laughs> Appreciate you, Israel. Um, that's why Text Fest Live exists, with what I mentioned earlier. That's why Fifth Star Funds exist. That's why Solo Fund exists. That's why we're all here. Um, I think it's. I think what Melissa said, right? <laughs> Everybody's not meant to be a leader, but I think we all have to collectively come together under specific leaders. I think even politically, I've had like a dozen discussions about this. So even more on the political side, I thought about, you know, our civil rights leaders, MLK, Malcolm X, this, that, and the third. And I think about, you know, it's a very different world than it was 56 years ago. But I think about, man, who's gonna be, who are the few voices that like all of black America can listen to? Right. Right, like who's gonna be that next? You know, I think they exist. I don't know who they are. Maybe they're in their late 20s, early 30s, 40s, I don't know. Like, who's gonna listen to that? 
I think the, to your capitalism question, right, from our African ancestors on, we're communal. We're community-based, so how do more projects and startups like Ronnie's get started? So he doesn't have to go to Tokyo to find right. an investor, right? We should be funding our own startups and small businesses in our own communities, right? So if we don't get the policy that we need in enough time, who are the executives, our middle managers, or even just, hey, I'm a regular live, uh, entry level employee, how do I find about that? I don't know the direct solution besides making a social network with black people. Well, Spill App is doing that in their own way. Um, if you don't download Spill App, it's pretty cool. Um, but I think eventually it's, just, it's simple. It goes back to how are we finding out about our own communities and then creating the pipelines like Tech Fest Live to say, oh, I, I'm, I'm 10 years old, I'm 14, and I found out about tech, I found out about AI, this is the future, and reaching back. It's hard to do at scale, but communal, community based learning and financing is how it gets done the, the easiest way. Who our leaders are. Mm. What I mean by that is when we think back, and I'm not suggesting you are saying this directly, but I know many people think back to the 60s and they think like Martin Luther King was the leader, when in fact he wasn't. He was a leader. It's Bernard. We had Malcolm X, we had Fannie Lou Hamer, we had a bunch of other people that were making arguments to advance our civil rights. Now, he certainly has been amplified in our minds in large part because we recognize him as a national holiday, and understandably so. But there are many others who were on the front lines that were fighting for a civil rights that had different philosophical viewpoints. And so I think we should be careful not to anoint one person to lead a monolithic group that has different viewpoints. Second, let's just think about the word diversity. There is no federal law that says that diversity means X. That's right. You can have geographic diversity, you can have racial diversity, you can have gender-based diversity, you can have a bunch of different types of characteristics that you use to define diversity. Remember, diversity, equity, and inclusion as a program or as an initiative only exists because companies created these programs as a defense because they didn't want to get sued. So it was, let's create these programs so when someone says you don't have any black people, we said we have these programs that are looking to recruit black and brown people or women or people of different abilities. That's why those programs exist. But keep in mind, there is no federal law that says her company or her company has to create a certain type of program. Right. The, the, and that's part of the opportunity and the risk because we've allowed others to define what diversity means, and as a result, we're caught in a trap when we align ourselves with their definition that we're then subject to. So I would say those two things, we have to continue to think expansively about this work, not anoint one person, bring a variety of perspectives to the table, because I'm not leading us there, she's not leading us there. All of us in this room will ultimately lead us to that place that we call liberation because we all have different perspectives that as a collective will get us there. I think that's a great note to end on. So uh, I think we have uh, food and drink. Who am I turning this over to? Back to Preston. <laughs> All right, folks, let's have a, a huge hand uh, of applause for the, the panel. It's not, it's not very often when you get this sort of brain power together um, on the same panel, sharing some really you know, interesting perspectives, insightful perspectives, actionable perspectives. And I hope, I hope and I pray that everyone in here walks away. I don't know how many times we heard the word collective community. and community, collective and community. It's the only, that, not the only way, it is one of the most critical ways forward that I heard today. We, put, we talk about oh, people getting exposure to opportunities and resources. It happens in the collective, in the community. Belong to something, become part of something. 
because it's going to require us. I mean, the game is the same. It's an old game. Rules are changing. Right. People are changing. Some stuff is going to come out. For us to be resilient and not react, but move as a unit, we must be a collective and community. That is the most important thing that I will say, be, become part of something where you can actually learn and be and, and broaden your, your, your perspectives, right? Follow, and I'll just share this quick story. I had someone, we would talk about the Fearless Fund at, on a panel, and I asked the audience, how many of you are familiar with the Fearless Fund lawsuit? And it was like 10% of the people raised their hand. And we were at a black tech summit, 10%. And then after the event, the brother came up to me and says, why do I not know about this fearless fund? Why are our people more concerned about what the entertainer Bobo is doing with, you know, Shishi or whatever? Why are they more concerned about that? And we're not concerned about what's going on with the fearless fund. How come we don't know about that? Well, what are you following? Right. What's in your feed? Who are you following? What you care about? I follow each one of these folks right here. Right. Right? Whether I talk to them directly or not, I I'm getting that flow. I learn from Melissa, even though I don't talk to Melissa for four or five months. Right? It is all of us together. Become part of something. Join something. Right? Follow somebody. All right? Um, of worth and note. Yeah. So um, I am so deeply appreciative. Thank you all for coming out this evening. My Diverse, uh, goal we still in life, and one of my superpowers, I believe, is to bring people together. I think I did all right today. Yes. I think I did all right. <laughs> yeah, I think we did all right. Um, so I'm excited to move forward. Uh, some people were, were asking me, you know, what's next? What's next? Hey, join the mission. I know we're a nonprofit, so, you know, I came in eight years ago, so <laughs> I know you said how many more we need. I, I'm already in. I'm in. I'm good. I'm in. You don't need no more, but you good. <laughs> Um, That's bad. But join, join the mission, right? Yeah, we get this QR not. code, we'll have a table up here. We want you to join, right? We learn from you too. If we need to get together more often, let us know. Let us know. We live here. Y'all yeah, welcome here. Come on through. Okay? Um, I think that's it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna close out. Right? We love y'all. We thank y'all for coming. I love my people up here. Melissa, Afonso, JT, Rodney, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, thank you. This is beautiful to see. Thank you all uh, for coming. Let's go get some food, some drink, and come, you know, come definitely meet uh, our panelists as well. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. I'm gonna hide behind you real quick. This good old boot. Boot. Let's just get the Christian Louis Vuitton in now. <laughs> Right. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Who we looking at? Oh, okay. All right. All right, then. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right we got like that. Well, I hope so. Hey, ma'am. How are you? What up? Hi, how are you? Good to see you again. Cheryl, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. This turnout is amazing. <laughs> this one are one of our stars. Really? 
just going to revolutionize the next level of things, just so you know. <laughs> yes. yes, Alan. Alan Gray, yes. Yes. Are you on? I was going to say, did you connect with me already? Yes.